Here we find ourselves in the space between halacha and Kabbalah. If you take the Kabbalah away from the halacha, then you have the standard typical Jewish life of the standard typical American Jew. If it has an OU, it's kosher. I don't have to worry about it. But Kabbalah says that there is more going on than just what's in the ingredients. Yeah? That what you consume affects your soul. Some examples. And particularly when it comes to milk and baked goods, Kabbalah is, uh, Kabbalah is extra, extra sharp in its insistence that a Jew be careful not to drink milk that is not uh, constantly and completely supervised by a Jew called Chalav Yisrael, um, and that we should be very careful not to eat baked goods where a Jew has not had some involvement in the baking process called Pas Yisrael. What is the result? What will happen? What happens is that when we consume those things, the influence of the life force of those things tends to, to dull and weaken our attachment to Hashem, our faith in Hashem, and our ability to trust in Hashem completely and to be moved by the words of Torah. Um, if you view the Chachamim's teachings as um, based on the given reason, then when the reason falls away, the restriction falls away. From the perspective of Kabbalah, the Chachamim reveal to us a absolute Torah truth and sometimes provide a reason that brings the rule, the new prohibition, closer to human intellect. But when they ruled originally, that was not in response to some human intellectual issue, that was just revealing a Torah truth that is and will always be absolutely true. I'll try to give some examples from, that we learned from the Rabbeim. When it comes to, for example, the second day of Yom Tov, when you're outside of Israel, in the diaspora, the Jew Jewish people celebrate two days of Yom Tov. And when you're in Israel, Jewish people celebrate one day. And there's a debate what you should do if you're traveling, if you're an Israeli citizen and you're in the United States or in the diaspora for Yom Tov, should you keep your standard one day as you would at home? Or do you observe the two days as, as do the diaspora Jews and vice versa? <laughs> the reason given is that uh, we wouldn't know when Rosh Chodesh was declared. Rosh Chodesh could only be declared on two possible days. So the question is, was Rosh Chodesh declared early or was Rosh Chodesh declared late? If it was declared early, then Monday would be Yom Tif, And if, it was the, if Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the new month, was declared late, then Tuesday would be the Yom Tif. And therefore, because we in the diaspora are not nearby to the Supreme Court of the, uh, the Supreme Torah Court in Jerusalem, to be able to hear the news of when Rosh Chodesh was established in time, we just observe both days. When Rosh Chodesh was declared by eyewitnesses, only when somebody, only when somebody in the Holy Land saw the new moon appear in the sky, only then could the court declare Rosh Chodesh based on that person's testimony. There was not a system of, of calendars like we have today. Today we have a system of calendars. And therefore, the question arises, since we know when Yom Tif will be, when Rosh Chodesh will be, why do the diaspora Jews still have to observe two days of Yom Tif? The doubt as to when Rosh Chodesh is established and the doubt as to when Yom Tif will fall has been solved. Why are we still observing two days of Yom Tif? The halachic answer is the Chachamim of old established it and nobody has the chutzpah to undo it. That's the halachic answer. The Kabbalah answer is when you're in the Holy Land, the light of Yom Tif penetrates you, permeate, permeates your life in one day. When you're in the diaspora, the effect of the Yom Tif, the effect that the Yom Tif is meant to have on you, it takes two days. It doesn't happen in just one day. So you see, there's a true spiritual reality behind the decree of the Chachamim, and the given reason is a, is a garment a vessel 
something that the Chachamim explained on a, on a lower level than the absolute truth. The decree is absolutely true. The reason given is only one layer, one level of explanation. And around an absolute truth, there are layers and layers and layers of explanation. So the same is true when, when the Chachamim say, don't eat such and such a food. The, that is an absolute Torah truth. The absolute truth is that this food damages your soul. The given reason is you can't be sure that the food hasn't been tampered with and that there isn't some kind of non-kosher material in there. So from a purely reasonable perspective, based on the given reason, if a person can prove that there is no forbidden substance in the milk, then Jewish law would not forbid that milk, right? According to Kabbalah, it's deeper than that. If the milk is not constantly supervised by a Jew, the very, the very DNA, the spiritual DNA of that milk is not from the camp of moderate impurity. That milk belongs to the camp of absolute unholiness absolute evil, absolute impurity. There is a story that's told by the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe about the Alter Rebbe, that one time a very fine Jewish family had a very fine Jewish daughter who married a very fine young Torah scholar and everything is fine. And one day the scholar starts hearing in his head the voice of heresy. He starts asking himself, in his analysis of Torah and Yiddishkeit and life, heretical questions. And it bothered him tremendously. So he told his father-in-law. And his father-in-law ran to the Alter Rebbe, obviously very bothered by the, by the issue. And the Rebbe told him, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, says the Alter Rebbe. There is no doubt that when a fine young Jewish man starts having doubts in his faith in Hashem, it's because he is drinking or he's consuming milk that is not in the category of Chalav Yisrael. 